So I'm joined here by Heather Barrett-Mould, who is Hello. a master gardener at the Worshipful Company of Gardeners, and we're here at the Guild Hall in the City of London. Heather, tell me more about what you do. Uh, well, I'll tell you about the Worshipful Company of Gardeners. Yes. So the Worshipful Company of Gardeners, even though it's got gardeners in its title, mm. it's all aspects of horticulture, all aspects of horticulture. So it's horticultural science, it's design, it's just everything. The whole Production spy. of food, yeah, everything. Um, but within the city, actually, as we're here, one of the things we do is we build a garden on um, Guildhall Yard every year. Um, and it's, it's a bit like a Chelsea garden. <laughs> and the idea is to advertise the big curry. So it's built a month before the big curry lunch and it stays there for a whole month. So it has to be looked after for that length of time. Um, and last year we actually built, uh, well, last year, this year in March, we built um, a green wall, uh, which was based on a checkerboard design, and it was supposed to be snakes and ladders of mental health. Um, so it was a lovely garden, yeah? Uh, so we do that every year. Um, we have a team of just under 40 judges who go around the city, they spend at least four days every year going around judging the planting, but also encouraging the planting. Mm. And then we have two big award ceremonies um, to try and encourage people to put more and more planting in the city. Wow. And, and it was set up originally when the whole place was just a bomb site. Yeah. And the idea was to get people to put in window boxes and cheer the place up. Um, and it's just grown and grown. Yes, there are a couple of things we do. It's, it's, it, that's a lot of things that you do. That's not a couple. So have you seen like a really big impact from people wanting to get involved with things like window boxes and the, and the garden? Yeah, definitely. And, it, and especially since the lockdown in March, I mean, people are so much more enthusiastic about their green spaces. And um, there have been quite a number of surveys done. And what people are saying is, that post lockdown, they want those green spaces lo looked after. Amazing, so will mm. it be kind of your job to look after those green spaces and really push and advocate for them for the public? Certainly push and advocate for mm. them. That's what we do, we try to influence policy, we work with our industry to help support that industry. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. It's lovely to see such a connection back with nature, especially in such an urban city as London. It's, it's amazing actually that, you know, you don't necessarily notice it when you're walking around but as you go around the city there are lots of pockets yeah. of green space yeah Amazing. yeah With these pocket parks have you seen when talking to kind of contractors and sorting out buildings have you seen more of a boost in in pollinating plantation yeah I th so I talked to some of the contractors about yeah. this and actually they're very enthusiastic really yeah to put in pollinating plants and what they're, what they're saying to me now is that more of the people that ask them to work for them are asking for more pollinating plants, good plants for pollinators. Um, so it's really encouraging and I think we just need to do as much as we can to show people actually it's not that hard. Yeah. You know, there's quite a range of plants that you can draw on, um, yes, to make it happen. Absolutely incredible. And now with the city much quieter, I say as a car zooms past, <laughs> much quieter city walking around, you see a change in these window boxes and how they've been growing over lockdown. Um, the contractors has, have just been coming, because the contractors as well as planting them mm. are contracted to look after them. Um, and they've just been coming in and making sure they're all okay. So um, it's not very changed really. It no. just always carries on. <laughs> yeah, they keep they keep growing, they keep going. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, so we're sat behind this beautiful pond here that's looking very lush and green. So what's so important about water spaces alongside green spaces? So I think uh, people are fairly conscious of the fact that pollinators need nectar and they need pollen. Yeah. But they tend not to think that actually they need water as well. And they need water that they can access and not drown in. Ah, okay. um, so here you could see that they could they could get water off the lily pads mm. 
because there are small amounts of water on their lily pads that they're going to be able to access. Yeah. But actually it's really easy to give water to pollinators because you can just put some stones in the bottom of a, a plant tray mm. um, and then put water in it so it's not quite full and they'll be able to go on the stones and access the water. It's very simple so and huge, it makes such a difference. Yeah, a huge misconception that we need these giant lakes and yeah. ponds. Obviously we do oh, need, we do need those ponds. for all sorts of other yeah. reasons. But yeah. within the city we can be doing it ourselves yeah. with, with just yeah. stones and water. Yeah. That's absolutely, and I would never have thought about <laughs> <laughs> pollinators on lily pads getting, getting a drink. Yeah. That's wonderful. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm really excited really nice to see, to what see it. <laughs> Hello, I'm speaking to you for Pollinating London Together. Obviously, I'm speaking to you from Cornwall, about as far in Britain as you can get, well, England, as I can get away from London, um, from Eden, the Eden Project, which is the home of the National Wildflower Centre. So we like to think we know a thing or two about pollination and um, pollinators, and we're very excited about it. And we plant acres and acres and acres of wildflowers every year um, in an attempt to both encourage the pollinators uh, and thereby the wider biodiversity of the landscapes we're working in, um, uh, and also rather selfishly to provide great colour. Um, I think it ought to be said about pollinators that a lot of people go crazy about bees. Um, I go crazy about bees. I am one of the patrons with Michael Evis at Glastonbury of the British native black honey bee, which is a very, uh, a very cool bee, uh, and it brilliantly adapted to the, um, to the English countryside. Uh, however, it has a weakness. It has a weakness. Uh, to Italian and Swiss bees that escape from um, the big greenhouses for tomatoes in the southeast mainly. And they breed because they like doing all that stuff, but they're not that tough. So when the temperatures go beneath three degrees, they all keel over and die. Um, and the ones that don't die are generally weakened enough to be killed off by neonicotinoids uh, to create a real problem. So we're creating a reserves all over the place for these bees. Uh, the Wildflower Centre has taught us uh, two things, one of which is to only get your pollinating plants uh, or, uh, or pollinators correct is a bit like starting a hospital um, and only having a plastic surgery capacity. Um, you've got to look at wildflowers and pollinators as part of an entire ecological system and there is a really annoying irony that most wildflowers prefer the worst ground, they don't like over rich ground, uh, which means that you've got to be quite um, quite creative in terms of building up the garden that you want uh, in, in a city uh, to adapt to the soil conditions to provide the maximum life, um, both for pollination to take place, for pollinators to thrive, um, and also for those self-same pollinators to provide food for the other um, creatures that like to thrive on invertebrates. Um, and even so, in London, um, you have a whole range of predators, raptors, that themselves like to eat the creatures that are eating the insects, and so on. So it's a kind of a circle of life. One of the questions would be, I guess, to encourage the most people to plant uh, flowers in London that create the maximum impact, you need them to feel as if they were getting colour throughout the year. And if I was doing that, I would probably start being lazy by nature. I would start with lavender on the grounds that lavender looks marvellous all year round. It smells beautiful. Plants, um, I don't think there are any plants uh, other than lavender that are brilliantly in colour all year round. You'll probably correct me on this, but I'd have some lavender um, because it's good for the soul, good for pollinators. I would have um, wallflowers because they're marvellous in the spring so you get some great spring colour the nectar I'm told tastes pretty nice but not as nice as scabious which would be my third choice um, I adore scabious it flowers for a darn long time its nectar is considered amongst the best by pollinators I have this on good authority um, and uh, it makes great great cut flowers as do cornflowers which we plant acres of 
uh, at Heligan and Eden. Um, they're just so scrummy to look at. They, that, that blue is startling, absolutely startling. Um, so let's have some of those. I think we'll go for some fox gloves. Um, what else would I have? I would have Cosmos. I'd have Cosmos simply because the unlikeliness of Cosmos just pleases me. Every time I plant seeds of Cosmos, these tiny little strandy things come out and they look as if they're a bit like the fluff on a youngster's beard as they start to grow a beard. And then you suddenly see the stem getting tough and it gets hardy and it grows and then it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And, it grows. and it's just an explosion of joy. Really, it's a marvellous thing. The fronds and the bold petals, um, they please the human eye as much um, as they do uh, the pollinators. So, what have we got? We've got foxgloves, lavender, cosmos, cornflower, scabious, wallflowers. You can't go wrong. I'd have, also, I'd have some... Um, wilder wildflowers I'd, I'd probably go for a whole bunch of ferns in there to just make it fatter um and to be honest i'd go for things like teasels too um but that's enough for me i think you've got plenty to be getting on with so let's hear it for the pollinators let's hear it for the project of pollinating london together let's hear it for the bees and don't forget the hoverflies they need love too what i'm really interested in doing is looking after the bee and I'm interested in bees as pollinators more than for the honey. So probably about eight or nine years ago, I started looking at bees and how bees live in the wild. Mm. And um, at that time, and, and still now, really, people believe that bees can't live in the wild without humans, you know, um, looking after them. And, and there are various diseases that bees get. And there's a, bee, there's a mite that affected the bees and it came in the 1980s called varroa mite. And that's been affecting bee health for... Uh, the last however long. So my, I started looking at bees in the wild and thinking, well, why aren't they dying? Why can bees live in the wild without all these, these toxic chemicals and stuff? So that's led me down a path of, of making hives, um, like these log hives, and, and seeing how bees behave. And we've had fantastic results of healthy bees. Wonderful. Yeah. So what is so different between your type of hive and a more traditional type of hive? Okay, so can I, if I can get a traditional hive, might, a traditional hive might look like something like this, in, in that it's a, it's a box, a rectangular box with sides about tw two centimeters thick, and then we're putting in frames like this, with, which have um, wax sheets, and then we're basically keeping bees in, in boxes and then we put a, a queen excluder on top and then we're trying to draw honey out of it. With, so basically the main difference is that a log hive is a thick walled cylinder so, and we're letting the bees grow their own, own comb. So rather than keeping them in frames, we're letting them build comb as they, they like and we're just letting bees work, you know, live as they would do in the wild. Okay. So explain what we have here in front of us. Okay, so this is, this is one of my log hives that was put up in May this mm -hmm. year. And, and May, end of April, May is really when the swarm season starts, which is when bees are looking for somewhere else to go. And we put this up, and with, with the hives, the bees like it. If they can, firstly, they've got to be able to find the, the hive. So if it, was, if it was too dense a foliage, a crown, you wouldn't, the bees wouldn't come. So you want to make sure... There's two things. A, that there's a flight path out, or rather a flight path in. And then also you want to face it sort of south, southeasterly, so that bees can, they're more active. Obviously, if the sun hits them early in the morning, they become more active, especially useful in the winter. So, so when I'm placing hives, I'm placing them with that in mind. And with this tree, the good place is about sort of 10 foot off the ground or 8 foot off the ground. And um, as I said, they came about two days later massive swarm came in and then they've been growing ever since so they've only been with a we call these foundlings colonies mm. so it's their first year and they've got to build you imagine all the skeleton all the comb yeah and then have enough bees to then go out and bring in enough nectar for stores for the winter so they've got quite a lot to do and luckily this year's been good so they've been busy and now now they've built, hopefully they've built their comb mm. 
and they're preparing for winter, so they're bringing more propolis to keep the hive healthy. And it looks like today that they're just, they're doing this thing called washboarding, <laughs> which is like kind of line dancing outside yeah. the house. And they're, they're, they're basically putting propolis on the outside. Mm. So where, where they walk in, that sort of cleans their feet, as it were. Wonderful. So um, it'd be interesting to see, see how they are, how they behave when we look in. Two earwigs. Wow. So it's all looking good. see how that they've been cleaning and so it's absolutely there could be 30,000 bees in there and yet the bottom is spotless and this is this is propolis that they you can see the whole board is stained slightly yellow yeah. where they stained it with propolis um, those are some wax scales mm -hmm. that I was talking about early on but you can see the bees are amazingly gentle they're just busy been busy cleaning and then this one here this 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 bigger one here this is a drone okay. with a slightly rounder okay so this is another wild colony this time it's in an oak tree a pollarded oak tree where there's a branch would have rotted off creating a start of a cavity and bees have been in here probably a long time i only spotted them about five years ago and so just like the log hives i come and check perhaps two or three times a year to see, see them. With the, with the log hives, I can take the base off and I can look up at the comb and I can look and see the debris on their hive. Mm. But a lot of the time, if you can see a bee bringing in pollen um, and is active, then that's a good sign that everything's healthy in the hive. You don't need to do anything more. And obviously a tree like this, all we can see is the activity around the entrance. Yeah. Well, at this time of year, it's the flowering season slowed down, so the bees are bringing in lots of propolis and are just trying to protect their entrance. So you can see I'm, I'm up here now, I haven't got a, not wearing my veil, but the bees are busy doing their work and they don't see me as a threat. Um, yeah, it's an amazing sight. So what they're doing is they're, they're putting propolis around the entrance, mm. but then there are also other bees fanning so yeah, here's some bees. Because I'm, because I'm sort of blocking the entrance, there's a lot of bees returning now who are a bit confused. Mm. Um, and so if they go high pitch around my ear, I know I'm about to be stung, but they <laughs> seem to be all right at the moment. So, so they've, been, they've been out getting nectar and they're coming back. But the, they're also, the other job for the bees to do is to, to extract that nectar, sorry, the liquid from the hive and keep it cool so they're bees fanning. So this whole misconception that we have about bees hating us and wanting to sting us is completely our own fault for interfering in the way that they... I think hide. so. I mean, and, and more, more recently, people are worried about anaphylactic shock and being stung. And, and that's true. It, it, some people can be badly affected. But generally, there, there are wild colonies around that most people, because they're looking at their phones perhaps more now anyway, they don't see. Mm -hmm. And I've got hives in cities that people don't even know about and they're wild colonies in in buildings in roofs and chimneys that people just aren't aware of but it's it, what, what's so great about it once you get away from that fear then people can start to connect to that insect and start thinking about flowers and what's that insect feeding on and also other insects that's that's for me anyway I've learned more I've lived in the country all my life and I've suddenly so much more aware about what's going on other insects and other pollinators um, I'm not driven by honey in the same way as, as you would if you were just a normal beekeeper. For me, the main takeaway has been that we as individuals have been doing a great job 
but there's so much more that we can be doing mm. and must be doing to help these pollinators. Mm. Would you agree with that? I, I totally would agree with that. And I think, I think actually we've got to the stage now where we need to act now. Mm. Um, there's been a lot of talking about pollinating and the environment, but actually let's top, stop the talk and let's have... Um, some action and it's a very small area the square mile it's, we're not setting our targets high um, but I think it's really important we start somewhere and you've got a great group of people in the city that have access to all sorts of resources that can make these things happen so we must make them happen um, going forward and I'm looking forward to seeing that actually I think that's the best thing I could say about it. Pollinating London together is an important strategic vision that uh, um, is important for all of us and we should all focus our efforts on it yes. for the future. And one of the main things that I've taken away is just how happy this has made people as well. So it really does improve the communities mm. of the City of London, of the London boroughs and beyond that. Mm, absolutely. So thank you very much for watching. Please take on board some of the ideas that we have been talking about and implement them in your own lives. And if you want any more information, then please keep up to date with Pollinating London Together. Sue, Master, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much.